on the programme this week. It's always nerve-wracking when a manufacturer changes a favourite car. And the Subaru Impreza has long been a favourite of you, me, Motor Week and just about everybody. I've been out driving the new one. Please God, let it be good. Meanwhile, Citroen may well have lost their reputation somewhat in recent years for building truly new and innovative cars, but they must be doing something right because we're buying them by the bucket load. Their sales figures are going through the roof. Ian Royal checks out the new Zara Sport. Obviously, the Impreza is a critically important car for Subaru in the UK, as well as exciting for all of us. So any changes, Ed, and I know you've got the keys to it. I have got the keys, Richard. Mm. Any changes are going to be absolutely critical. So what have you done? Is this just a facelift? This is far more than a facelift. This is an entirely new Subaru Impreza. A great car, just got even better. So what are we talking about? New headlamps and that's it? Or like body, engine, the works? The entire body, the entire chassis, the, the transmission, the engine have all been re-engineered to raise Impreza driving performance to even greater heights. Critically important, of course, in the UK for you. It really matters. Absolutely. The Subaru Impreza is our most important model in the UK. Oh, God, and I wish I had not. performance in the UK is such that oh, the sales are the highest talking. in the world. Particularly of the turbocharger. Oh, variants, wait me if he says anything interesting. Relish, and maybe one day you'll get this must be about driving the thing. Just give me the 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 in Europe by far. One yep. The yep. Yeah, okay. yep. Oh, come on. The performance of the new Subaru Impreza while satisfying the... Oh, this guy can talk. European type approval Do I really look interested in emissions? Environmentally friendly. Oh, I wish he'd just give me the keys. 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds. A top speed of over 140 miles an hour. Are you really sure you're ready for it, Richard? Yes, give me the keys. <laughs> I mean, you know, on and on. I just want to drive it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. As soon as you pull away, there's no doubt that you're in an Impreza turbo, mostly because of the engine note. It's still that gorgeous, horizontally opposed boxer, four cylinders, beating out that way, so you get a lovely raspy note. Can't mistake it for anything else. Huge amount of torque, so you pull away, leap off, and then the drive itself, well, first impressions, the suspension is just overwhelmingly competent. It soaks up the smaller bumps and feels actually quite comfortable, but as soon as it gets a bit harsher and you start to push the car, it tightens up and you can feel it is going to keep the car glued to the road. It is nice to know that the Subaru is not going to break down. It is going to be utterly reliable, dependable, a car that you can use every single day. It's no accident that the Impreza benefits from what is probably the world's best 4x4 system. That system is the result of Subaru's years of involvement at the very top level in rallying. Then there's the steering, which is absolutely gorgeous. It weights up beautifully. It's absolutely rock steady about the straight ahead. And as soon as you start to put a bit of lean on it, it'll tighten up and weighten up so you can just feel what's happening. It's actually very, very comfortable. The driving position feels just right and the suspension comfy. Speed does creep up on you still. That's another thing it has in common with the old Impreza. You think you're pressing on nicely, then you look down and realise you've just been your licence. Driving an Impreza would become addictive. If you have one of these things, I don't doubt you'll find yourself taking it out of the garage just for a bit of a tour around. And that's in a four-door, four-seater saloon. The Impreza's looks have always been secondary to the performance, so we won't get too caught up on it. Suffice it to say, the only really contentious bit is the front, which does look a bit <laughs> wide-eyed and eager. We'd rather it looked a little bit more mean like the old one. But it is all about the drive, and at first drive, it's difficult to tell much. You need about a week with an Impreza to do it in depth, and we will do that for you soon. But at first impressions, certainly, if anything, it's perhaps a bit more sophisticated, which in my mind makes it a bit more of an all-rounder. Fans of the really raw aspects of the old Impreza 
might say it's gone a bit soft. For me, it still offers unbeatable performance and comfort and reliability, and at under £22,000 for the top-notch version, nowhere else can you get that kind of performance for that kind of cash. So I see no reason why the Impreza shouldn't continue to enjoy the same cult following it has to date. Nice one. Welcome to Death Valley, California one of the most inhospitable places on earth. A few years ago, it would have seemed the perfect location for Skoda cars, because most people thought that Skoda was very much on its last legs. And this is Furnace Creek, known to the locals as the gateway to the hell that is Death Valley. And that's why we're here to put the Skoda Fabia to the ultimate extreme weather test. So as you can see, I'm all strapped up, I'm wired up, my heart monitor tells me that I'm a cool 70 heartbeats to the minute. I'm all ready to take on the desert. Here we go. We are right in the middle of Death Valley and if I'm sounding as if I'm dying that would be right. We've had the windows up for about 15 minutes with no aircon on and dear God let me tell you if you ever come to Death Valley make sure you've got air conditioning and we've got about another 10 minutes to go if I make it before we can get back and do the same route with aircon do I need aircon I've got to have water Oh, that's like hot tea, gee. This has been in the air conditioned box. Unfortunately, the air conditioning is off and so is the water. I love the heat and some people like it hot, but let me tell you, this is ridiculously hot. I don't ever want to be this hot again. This is the second run of the Death Valley circuit and as you can see there's a big difference because wonderfully we've got aircon and what a difference. It's like going from hell to heaven. My blood pressure has gone from high 80s back down to just round about 70. I feel cool. And it's not just the aircon and the driver that get put to the ultimate test in Death Valley. Skoda also use the searing heat to test all the in-car fabrics, the material on top of the steering wheel, all the dash and the doors. So doctor, what's the verdict of my state of health after that uh, drive through the deadly desert? You are in a very good condition. Can for a man of your age. Thank you, I'll take that as a compliment, doctor. <laughs> so as the good doctor said, the only thing I really need now after my epic drive in the desert is water. Lots and lots of lovely, cool water. I think I've found just the place. Yahoo! driving round in a classy motor that can only be described as a limo for the price of, say, a new Ford Mondeo. How? Well, buy yourself one of these, a BMW 7 Series. Now this is a 740, it's the latest model, it's about four years old and has done 72,000 miles. At the moment, this car would cost you just over 14,000 pounds. Now, 14 grand is still a lot of money, but consider when this car was new, it cost 
over £50,000. Now, there's very little apart from the obvious that you need to check out for on cars like this. If it's got a fully stamped up BMW service history, that's half the battle won. Check out for the tyres because these things are expensive when you need to replace them, about £200 a throw. And most of these cars have been used by company bosses and directors for cruising up and down the motorways. Also on the 7 Series, one thing to note out for is with the 728 model, the 2.8 engine was particularly notorious when it was first launched and many did in fact need replacing. The engine in the 740 at launch was a 4-litre V8, but changed a couple of years later to a 4.4 V8 with power of 286 brake horsepower. And it will still average around 21-22 to the gallon, which is not bad for such a big car. If you like a car with all the options, well, this 740 has certainly got the lot. It's got an integrated car phone. It's also got climate control, a superb stereo system, including a six CD changer in the boot, controls on the steering wheel for the stereo and for cruise control. It's got a sunroof as well, and it's also got wonderful electric seats which go just about every which way, including down and back. This evolution of the 7 Series was first introduced in 1995 on an M plate and said to have more computing power than the Space Shuttle. There's plenty to choose from in the 7 Series range, from the base 728 up through the 730 and 735 to the top and the 750 with its wonderfully sweet V12 engine. Now this car at a main dealer would probably cost about £20,000, so for 14 or so you're getting something of a bargain. And if you do like big cars, now is the time to buy. Values have slumped quite dramatically. For instance, I've seen a 750 V12 that cost £80,000 new, now on sale for less than 20. So, sure, this is a big car, but it's also incredibly luxurious and supremely comfortable. Big leather seats, walnut cappings, it's got the whole works on it. You can really feel at home in a car like this. And what pleases me most about this car is knowing that the first owner paid about four times as much as this car is worth now. Put a private number plate on it and no one will know you've got a four-year-old Beamer. Should certainly give the neighbours something to gossip about, eh? So that's my used car tip for this week the BMW 7 Series. You're watching MotorWeek. Join us after the break for more of the latest from the world of cars. A lovely long line of pristine new Volvo V70 cross countries. And I'm in Denmark to test drive them and this is my car. First stop is a very peculiar thing. It's a bridge that isn't open to the public yet and hasn't finished being constructed. What's so special about that? I'm gonna go find out. Here I am driving along a lovely bridge in the sunshine, but this is no ordinary bridge. This is the first ever bridge between two countries, those countries being Denmark and Sweden, and it's a pretty long bridge, 16 kilometers long. In fact, it's the biggest ever erection that the Danes and the Swedes have managed. <laughs> and in construction, of course. And you know, Volvo have managed to secure us a test drive across this bridge before it's even due to be open on the 1st of July. Not bad, eh? The Orison Bridge will ease traffic congestion and allow easy travel between Denmark and Sweden. Oh, and it's being built without any damage to the surrounding environment. Good, eh? Here in Sweden at Nudge Stop, we've just had a very nice lunch stop. And now, seriously, it's time to try the V70's capabilities on an off-road course that Volvo have especially set up for us. Let's give it a go. I am driving a car that you'd normally take all the kids in through a really big pit of water. And it's fine. It's so fine. Normally when I'm on their roads like this, it's in the uh, co-driving seat of a rally car, and it's going, Rah! 
that really, really loud and you can't hear yourself think. Going round this wood off-road track in this Volvo, listen, I can't hear a blooming thing. The engine is so quiet. It's amazing. The thing I don't like about it, I think, is that I don't know whether you can see, but I'm having to kind of, like, sort of peer over the bonnet. If you were sat in a normal kind of 4x4, like a Discovery or a Cherokee, you've got a much higher driving position and you can see the road ahead of you much more. With this, you're sat really quite low and I find it a little bit disconcerting that I can't quite see when I'm driving, driving over this kind of terrain. Traction control, get up this hill. Here we go, yay! Is it gonna do it? Are we gonna do it? You know we're gonna do it. Fantastic, that is brilliant. The V70 is a solid drive on the road, as you would imagine from a car like this, but surprisingly, when you're going around the corners, it's ever so light. The steering is light and it tends to wallow a bit. In fact, it oversteers slightly when you're on a road like this. And when I first got in the car, it was ever so slightly unnerving. Yeah, it feels solid, but it's all a bit wibbly wobbly on the top. I was speaking to the one of the guys from Volvo earlier on, and he said that they've had to kind of compromise on the stability of the car when it goes around the corners to get it right when it's off road. And I agree with him there. <sighs> I'm in the middle of Sweden and I'm lost. Where is it, bastard? Oh, there it is. So that's how you spell it. Right, I know where I'm going now. They've got funny names here. The Cross Country offers great flexibility. Not only does it offer the comfort of a luxury saloon and the safety of a standard V70 estate, but has substantially improved all road abilities, which are previously only possible in an SUV. Ah, oh, it's nice here, isn't it? This is Tolokov, and it's just down the road from Bastard. And boy, was I glad to get out of that place. It's full of a right bunch of Swedes. <laughs> anyway, as you can see, the shape of the car hasn't changed much. It's a bit wider, a bit further off the ground, and it's got these lovely, well, all right, brown bumpers. Volvo tell me that they developed these so that when you're off-road, the car doesn't scratch as much as the colour-coordinated bumpers. Anyway, look, I can't stop long. I'm on my way to Smegham now. Sounds a nice place, doesn't it? wonder what they do there. The new Volvo Cross Country starts at just under 29k on the road, and it's based on the same platform as the V70 Estate. The ground clearance is 20.9 centimetres. Who'd have thought it? That is one millimetre more than the Cherokee and one millimetre less than the Discovery. And who'd have guessed it? Those few millimetres making all the difference. And us girls should know. <laughs> Safety, always a Volvo strong point, is unrivalled in the cross country with dual stage airbags, SIPs, side impact protection systems, whips, whiplash protection systems and the IC, which is an inflatable curtain, which is all provided as standard. What a fantastic day and I've arrived now in Tylersand, Sweden. And look, there's the beach and life is a beach, so I'm going to go and lie on it. There's no doubt that the French have flair, style and a certain je ne sais quoi, but when it comes to their cars, well, frankly, they can be a bit of a letdown. I mean, how many French cars would you actually want to rush out and buy? Um, not that many. So, in the crowded small to medium hatchback sector, this new Citroen Zara has some tough competition ahead. It's not a completely new car, but it has undergone some major revisions to fight off its rivals. The front gets Citroen's new family look, just like the Picasso and the upcoming C5, with this new grille and redesigned headlights. The rear gets a few tweaks like the boot lid, but the car retains the familiar Zara style. It now has a wider track front and rear, as well as larger 15-inch alloys.
Now, the Zara, as before, will come in a choice of three different body styles, three-door, five-door, and estate. Specification throughout the range has also been improved. The stereo now adjusts to your speed on the road. Curtain airbags and a first for a car of this size. Rear parking assistance will be optional extras. Prices, well, they're going to start at launch at £9,295, which includes a £1,000 cashback. So altogether, this is a pretty good value for money package. A new range of engines are perhaps one of the biggest draws for the new Zara, including a new 1.6-litre 16-valve engine producing 110 brake horsepower, which is fitted to this VTR. There's also a new 2-litre engine with 136 brake horsepower, two diesel engines, and of course there'll still be the hot VTS version with 167 brake horsepower. So what about the Zara? Well, it drives absolutely fine. I couldn't sit here and say, oh, this is absolutely awful, because it's not. Out on the road, the ride is smooth, as you would come to expect from Citroen. The steering has a decent feel to it, the brakes are sharp, the clutch and gear change are smooth as well. So after a few short hours spent with the new Zara, what are my initial impressions? Well, this 1.6 VTR is particularly fun. It's sharp, it's nimble, it's fun to drive, comfortable and roomy, and considerably cheaper than the outgoing model. And that's where I think Citroen have a big role in the marketplace, price, specification and value for money. And that's where they have a good bet with the new Zara. If you're wondering what this is, by the way, it's a Holden HRV GTS R. The interior might look a bit like a tough boudoir, but up front there's a 5.7 litre V8 engine taken straight from a Corvette. Mmm, I'm going to be test driving it in a week or two for Motor Week. See you then.